Hello, lovely people. I'm sure you're enjoying our videos. As you've realized, our videos are in two parts. We've got the course based ones that discusses the various sections of the law, and we've also got the everyday law. The course based are designed for academic study and in depth understanding of the law. But if you are interested in knowing about the law as it will appear or it will be useful for an everyday man, please always try and keep a focus on the everyday law content. It is done in vernacular and in simple and easy ways said that the man on the street will be able to appreciate the law in his daily life. If you stand in need of any academic support for any of your law courses, please do not hesitate to reach the number below, either via call or by WhatsApp. Stay tuned for more of our videos on Supreme Law Publications. Welcome. As you saw on, uh, on the advertise our post, we are going to discuss the rule in Ryland versus Fletcher. All right. I'm sure if you watched the previous video on nuisance, you totally understood the concepts that we discussed in nuisance. If you've not done so, I will entreat you to watch that video on nuisance before proceeding to watch this one that we're going to talk about. A couple of things, if you remember, we mentioned that when we say nuisance, it refers to a substantial or continuous interruption or interference with another's quiet enjoyment of his property, all right? So we, we discussed the elements. We spoke about public nuisance, we spoke about private nuisance, and what you should look at for if you want to establish an action in thoughts or an action in nuisance on that. We also looked at some of the remedies when you have nuisance um, coming in and what you have to do, okay? So I just urge you, and again, say, restate it in this, in this part of our video that if you're a student, make sure that you carefully analyze the facts that are given you if, for example, you are preparing to take your end of semester exam in thoughts or probably you are preparing for the Ghana School of Law entrance exam, make sure that you know the facts and see how you can use the elements to establish that. All right? Okay. So enough of the general subject of nuisance. In this video, as I've mentioned, I've introduced to you um, on, on the slide there, we are going to discuss the rule in Ryland versus Fletcher. Okay. What do we mean by the rule in Ryland versus Fletcher? What do we mean by that? You know, you can consider a situation where, for example, someone on his property has some bit of cattle, all right, cattle, sheep, or goods, which is very common here in Ghana. You have people who have um, um, in, in his house, he'll be rearing some, some, some sheep, or he has some, some heads of goods in there. Uh, usually, what happens, or the occasion that happens, is that these cattle or sheep or goods may probably step out maybe the gate was open something they just step out and race into someone's house or someone's crops nearby and just destroy them okay so so what happens what 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 is that all right that had been on the minds of several people over time and several matters went to court way 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 back in england and there had to be some kind of determinations on it now over time a matter arose and this matter became a landmark decision that we call the rule in rylands versus Fletcher. what was it it was a case where there were two people. Let's call the first person A, let's call the second person B. All right. So A um, decided to um, get some competent workmen, some contractors on his land. And when he brought them, their task was very simple. He wanted them to build a reservoir. All right. A reservoir where he would put a, a, a tank of a sort where there would be water inside and he used it for his purposes on his land because he was a mill owner. The, this, this was the 19th century, around 1800 and those days, 19th century. He was a mill owner where he, was, he, had a, he needed a reservoir to help him with what he wanted to do. Now, apparently, the connections that these contractors or these people had to do, the pipes that they were, they were laying, there were some old pipes or some shafts, as they would call it, that connected to B's land. But it, had not, it hadn't been used for a very long time. So as the workmen were, 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 were at it on A's property, the reservoir overflowed, there was too much water, and it spilled all over the land. And the water went through those pipes and entered onto B's land. Now, coincidentally, B2 was also using his land for some kind of, um, he had some underground mines, some mines there. So when the water went there, the water just flushed the whole mines, okay, such that it was difficult because, you know, mines are underground pits. So if water is flooding there, how then do you get the chance of going in there to go and work? Okay, so substantially, the purpose for which he was using his land had also been compromised in a way because he had brought the workmen and they had, out of this situation, created a, a, a kind of problem for him. The matter went to court. 
traveled severally along the English English legal system. Then he came to the court of the uh, the, the court of the Exchequer Chamber, the Exchequer Chamber, and one of the common law's finest justices of the 19th century, Blackburn, gave this locus classicus definition, and that is one that grounds the rule in Rylands versus Fletcher. Let's see what Blackburn J said in the in, in Rylands versus Fletcher. That set down the the the, the, the principle of Rylands versus Fletcher. Let's see. Blackburn J by the Escheca Chamber. We think that the true rule of law is that the person who for his own purposes brings on his land and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief if it escapes must keep it in at his peril. And if he does not do so, he is prima facie answerable for all the damage which is the natural consequence of his escape. Did you notice the, the famous quotation by Black Ben J? So when we talk about the rule in Rylands versus Fletcher, okay, the primary rule is what we have just seen here. Okay, he says that, and three things were apparent if you look at the, the quotation. It says, it mentions that if there is an item that is likely to cause mischief, an item that is likely to cause mischief, Two, that item is brought onto a land, collected by somebody, kept onto a land. So either the person is bringing it, he has, he's collecting it, or he's keeping it onto the land. And the third one, if that item that is likely to cause mischief should escape and cause any harm, which means that it should leave the confines of where it is being kept and cause any harm, the person who brought that, he is prima facie, on fair side, he is the one who is supposed to answer for the damages that has been location out of his keeping that in you. Guys, hope you understand that. So that is the first point or the point, the first point in the rule that we call Rylands versus Fletcher. That is what we're trying to mean. So guys, the students, there are three things. One, the person has brought, kept, or he's, he has collected something onto his land. Two, that item that he has brought onto the land it is capable or there is a likelihood that it can cause trouble. It can cause mischief if it escapes. Three, when it escapes, the person will be liable for that. So in an examination, when you are trying to examine the rules of Ryland versus Fletcher and you look at the facts, you need to ask yourself those three things. What item is, is being kept on the land? Is it being kept on the land? Has it been brought onto the land? Is it being collected on someone's land? Two. That item there, is it likely to cause danger, trouble, mischief, issues, if it should escape? Three, then if that escape should arise, and the damages that arises from there, the person who brought it will be liable for that. Hope you understand that. So let me give you a couple of um, practical examples to help you understand. You know, eh, these dogs that they call them the pit bulls, all right, this, this statement I'm making is not to say that anybody who keeps a pit bull is necessarily wrong. But if you have time, try and check the, 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 the history of pit bulls. That dog, that, that pit bull breed of dog, they are very, very, very dangerous dogs. Even in certain parts of America, the law even prescribes people from keeping pit bulls because they are very territorial. Okay? And the kind of injury that they can cause to an individual, I mean, if they are fighting, they are like, they are like beasts. You understand that? So in certain places, people are not even encouraged to keep pit bulls. They can even attack your own family. Those, 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 those dogs. So imagine two people, two neighbors. This person has got his house. They are all living together in a residential house. One person is keeping two pit bulls. This other family too is there with his wife and kids and all that. And probably there's a fence. Maybe a kind of a dwarf wall or something. That separates these two, these two families, their buildings. Okay, so this man has brought pit bulls and he's keeping them on his property. Now, what, what happens if by mistake something happens and those pit bulls should leave? Either they find a way through the fence, the fence that, that separates he and the other neighbor. They find a way through the fence and enters into the neighbor's house and attacks the neighbor's family. The question is that he, the person who is keeping the pit bulls, he would what? Answer for that. Hope you understand that. So that is what we mean by the rule in violence versus Fletcher. The defendant who is affected by that damage that has occasioned will sue 
on the rule of Rylands versus Fletcher. Why? Because a pit bull is likely to cause mischief if it escapes. He's not just any local dog. He's not just any local dog. Even if he steps out onto the street, I'm not sure that when you take one out of ten people, they'll be able to physically grab the dog and take it back. It's very, very difficult and very, very utterly dangerous to attempt to do something like that. You get it? So that is what we are trying to say. The object that is being kept there, it is dangerous if it escapes. The rule says that if you keep it there, you do so at your own peril. If a matter arises out of that, you cannot absolve yourself from blame. Hope you get that. That is it. Let me give you also another example. Um, recently, somewhere in Accra, um, in one of the apartments, a very famous guy brought in some tigers. You heard it, into a community. And he said that he had put up a cage somewhere and he was keeping those tigers there. So it came on TV and um, the media men went and they showed, the cameras were showing that there were metallic stats that had been put there to keep those tigers there. So the question is that, is it possible for that tiger to cause mischief if it escapes from that cage? Will it cause trouble if it escapes from that cage? I mean, the answer is obvious. If, if that tiger should leave the confines of that, I'm not sure there's anybody in the house or anybody in that apartment who will be able to leave. You understand that? So the rule in Rylands versus Fletcher is saying that if someone is keeping such a tiger, an object, an item, he has collected it, he has brought it onto the premise, okay, such that if it escapes, it is likely to cause mischief, then he does so at his own peril. If damages should come out, he is the one who has to what? Answer, answer for it. You get it. That is what we mean by a rule in Rylands versus Fletcher. It therefore means that somebody who suffers harm after the thing has escaped can bring an action against him to sue him for that. You, 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 you get it. That is what we mean by that. And also, let me give you this other example. Um, um, sometimes, eh, certain people would, maybe in a residential area, they would just, or they, their houses, they do some other businesses. Some of them are into soup making business. Others do, um, some of them even sell alcohol. Do they produce methylated spirits and those kind of stuff, you know? Uh, so, in some situations, the person will go and take a, 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 a huge consignment of gallons or barrels of alcohol or for, for purpose of use, for producing aquatashi and all those, you know, those kind of chemicals. Then he'll be keeping those chemicals in, in his yard, probably in his backyard. He's keeping that alcohol there and he's probably put some, 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 some dark rubber over it. He's keeping it onto the backyard. If there is a spillage of those chemicals, you know it can cause trouble. Maybe it can go to someone's sewer, enter another person's house and create some, some kind of trouble. So the rule in Rylan and Fletcher, that's what we're talking talk about. What you are keeping, is it likely to cause damage if it should escape? The escape doesn't necessarily mean an animal that has to run away, but if it should leave the confines of where it's being kept, it will cause trouble. So those who keep super glue on their premises, in their rooms, some of them keep tar, some of them keep even drugs. Some of the person who he's, uh, um, he, he, he's into some kind of business, then he'll be keeping certain kind of fluids and liquids and, you know, these chemical combinations and sometimes fertilizers and all, all those things on your property. Radans and Fletcher is saying that you do so at your own peril. If it should live, you would have yourself to be blamed and, and inflicts a, a damage onto your, uh, another person. You have yourself to blame. You understand that? So Blackburn J added this and it was an icing on the cake. Let's go back to his quotations in Rylands versus Fletcher by Black Benji. The justice continues. But for his act in bringing it there, no mischief could have accrued. And it seems but just that he should, at his peril, keep it there, so that no mischief may accrue, or answer for the natural and anticipated consequences. You saw that? Yes. So it is just buttressing the earlier part that he mentioned that if you are keeping it onto your property, you are doing so at your own peril. And you will answer, and this is the, this is the operative part, the students will watch out, for all natural and anticipated consequences. All natural and anticipated consequences. So if you keep such an item there, if you collect it, and I'm saying an item, it, it may not just be just animals, any other activity that is brought on onto the land. Okay, if you keep it there, any natural consequence that arises out of that, you will find yourself to be blamed. Let me give you a final example to illustrate this. Then we'll just see how it will pan out also for the students. Let's say that someone says, as for him, he likes, uh, he likes things natural. His food is always natural, okay? So he's a great lover of honey. 
So he decides to produce the honey himself. Now in a residential area, he gets somebody to just come and construct some box, okay, some set of box, some stacks of box. If you know how honey is harvested, then he'll try and go and get a bee, lose a bit, some bit of bees, and he begins breeding bees on the, on the property. <laughs> okay, the purpose of breeding the bees, okay, is to make sure that at the proper time, he'll be able to extract the honey out of the bees, then he would use it for his own personal purposes. You understand that? Now, on one hot afternoon, nobody knows what happened. Then, whether the bees got annoyed or something like that, they just left the hive. We're just scavenging around the neighborhood and they were just beating people, stinking people. <laughs> the question is that, what is going to be the liability that we ascribe to the person who brought those bees and kept them onto his land? Rylands versus Fletcher. You should know that these bees, anything can happen. Sometimes it can be a change in weather, a change in temperature. It can even be a perfume that they may, they may smell somewhere. It can trigger their, their reactions. So that is a natural and an anticipated consequence of keeping that. The rule says that when you do that, you do that at your own peril. Okay? So if a damage arises out of that, anybody who proceeds to bring an action to you in court, he will do that on the strength of what? Rylance and Fletcher. Guys, hope you're okay. So the point is this for students. How would you be able to, for example, distinguish a situation where this one, you say, okay, this question, should I go with a straight nuisance or I should go with Rylance and Fletcher? Okay, that will always be the part that will be put in an exam. Simple. Appraise the facts. When I say appraise the facts, read through the facts. Are you seeing from the fact that someone has brought an item onto the property? Someone's collected an item. Is someone keeping an item? Secondly, Look to the facts. That particular item that the person is keeping on the property, is this something that is dangerous if, you, if it should leave? Okay. Then you use that to do your examination. So mostly, when you find that in a, a, a question, it is Rylance versus Fletcher coming out. But you see, you have to set up your issue as a nuisance. Then you proceed on the rule of what? Rylance versus Fletcher. Okay. You can't raise your issue like whether or not, no. Raise your issue as to whether that constitutes, that damages that arises comes a bit of nuisance, then you would um, you proceed on the rule of what? Rylance versus Fletcher. You understand that? <laughs> because there are authorities, just by the way, there are authorities to the effect that Rylance and Fletcher, it seems, there has been some arguments, this is for pure theoretical purposes, that Rylance versus Fletcher has is kind of a subset of nuisance. Because you see, even at the time that the thing hadn't escaped, it was, it was dangerous. It was a threat. And once that threat was persistent, it constituted nuisance. So if someone is keeping bees on his land, he's keeping wild dogs, excessively wild dogs on his property, and you are an adjoining neighbor, and those dogs, they are likely to call his sheep, they are continuous presence there, it may constitute nuisance. So Rylance versus Fletcher comes in at a time where that particular continuous presence now escapes. You understand that? Then you proceed on Rylance versus Fletcher. But remember, the genesis is from the, is from the fact that there was some bit of nuisance. That is how come the Rylance versus Fletcher comes in to say that. That item that you are keeping there, there's a likelihood of it causing mischief. And therefore, if it escapes, you, the person who was keeping it, prima facie, you are answerable for any damages that arises out of that. Hope you're fine. All right. So now, this is the first point of Rylance versus Fletcher. Okay. You know, when the matter left the Exchequer Chamber and went to the House of Lords, Lord Keynes also added to some, some made a particular statement. And that statement, when you put it together with Blackburn's statement, it gives us two pointers to Rylance versus Fletcher. Guys, for students, the point is this. When we talk about Rylance versus Fletcher, it can operate in two distinct scenarios. One of the scenarios is where someone has brought an object onto a property. He is keeping something on the property. He brought it somewhere. And that thing that he has brought is dangerous. And therefore, if it were escaped, it will cause harm. The rule on Rylance versus Fletcher can be used for a grounds for bringing an action against him when the escape happens and the location is damaged. The second point that is gleaned from Lord Kane's statement at the House of Lords. He concurred with Blackburn. He agreed with Blackburn in his entirety. But he added that when the person is using the property for a non-natural use, non-natural use. So this is what Lord Kane's also added. Let's just take his quotation in that House of Lords statement by Lord Kane's in uh, Rylands vs. Fletcher. Still on the same matter at the House of Lords. This is what Lord Kane said. On the other hand, if the defendants, not stopping at the natural use of their clothes, had desired to use it for any purpose, which I may term a natural use, for the purpose of introducing into the clothes that which is in this natural condition was not in or upon it. 
Did you notice what Lord Cain said? So we just brought a part of his quotation. You realize that he, he used a word, non-natural use. So guys, the point I'm trying to say is that when we talk about ruling reliance on Fletcher, the second pointer is on the general scope of non-natural use. What do we mean by that? You know, the non-natural use is trying to say that if there are certain uses that the land is being put to, that is not incidental. That is not consistent with the general or acceptable or permissible use of that facility. It will constitute an unnatural use. And therefore, an escape that arises out of that, it's also part of the rule of Ryland versus Fletcher. The damages that will occasion will be fixed at the doorstep of the person who was using the land for that unnatural purpose. So again, for examinations, watch. You can have Ryland and Fletcher operating in first scenario. The person has brought objects onto his land and has escaped. That is fine. Second scenario, he has not necessarily brought an object, but he is doing something on the land. The way he's using the facility, okay, if a damage will arise as a result of an escape, okay, something leaving the confines of where that activity is going on and entering onto the neighbor's property, it also constitutes a part of Ryland versus Fletcher. It's essentially the same thing. And this was established by the House of Lords statement uh, rendered by Lord Keynes. You understand that? So let me give you an example um, of what we're seeing. In a residential area, so someone starts bee farming. Maybe when he started, he, he just brought a tiny bee. There are two bees on it. Ordinarily, you cannot say that those two bees would escape and cause trouble because they may be flying all around. But you see, when you now begin the practice, you have now elevated the land into farming purpose. Now, this is a, a first-class residential area. Let's suppose that you are living somewhere around cantonments in Accra or any of the high-class areas or first-class areas or you are in Kumasi and you are somewhere around in Shai, so Denyame, you know, a first-class residential area or any other highly residential area. And someone is, is, is now brooding bees on his property. The question is that, does that constitute an ordinary and natural use in the sense that, is that consistent with the reasonable use of the facility within that particular community? You, you, you get it. So if in such a high-class residential area, someone is breeding bees, you see, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit awkward. Or someone goes to hire an apartment and at, a, at, at his balcony, okay, maybe a high-rise building, there are several apartments there. Then at his balcony, he just allows a carpenter to make some small shelf. And within that shelf, he's keeping bees there so that he harvests it in an apartment. The question is that, does that constitute a natural use of the land, the natural use of the space? So what we are seeing, that the natural use is how you are using the space that is consistent with acceptable practices and lawful practices within that region. Okay, so if you, do, you use that for any other thing else, I mean, we are saying that a trouble or any article that leaves it and causes, mis and causes mischief, you'll be liable because of the natural use. All right. Or finally, let me just give an example of uh, someone also, um, let's say, in a certain residential area, okay, he decides to now set up some small business. Now, this business that he's doing, he's filling um, gas, okay? He's trying to replace or refill gas. He has started some small gas refilling um, um, business there, okay? Or probably he's just doing some small exhaust pipe welding. He's doing some welding. And this welding, you know, sometimes it may, use the, it may involve the use of propane gas and other kind of gas and all that kind of stuff. So he's just doing it in his, in his small corner somewhere in a residential area. The question is that, does that constitute a natural use? And when we say natural use, is it consistent with an acceptable use of that area when probably has not been de demarcated for such purposes and he's using it? Does that constitute a natural use? It may constitute a non-natural use in the sense that it is not consistent with acceptable lawful use of the facility within that particular section. All right, so if a damage arises as a result of an escape of the gas, maybe he did that and the gas got burst and it just exploded. Some woman was cooking somewhere in her next house. And you know, gas to, travels to air. So he went there and he just bent the woman up, you know, scalded her face and all that. And the question is that who is going to be liable for the damage? By Rylance and Fletcher, the person who is using that facility for that non-natural use will be held liable for those damages on the grounds of violence versus what Fletcher. Guys, hope you, hope you understand that. It's clear. All right, so we've been able to, at this point, establish what Ryland versus Fletcher is. Again, for emphasis, if someone brings an item onto his property and that item is dangerous enough or likely to cause mischief if it escapes, 
we are saying that he is prima facie liable for any damages that will arise. And, that, and he keeps that his own peril. That is it. Secondly, if he is putting the land into an unnatural use, and we explain that unnatural use means that you are using the facility in the way that it will not ordinarily and lawfully be the way that facility is intended to be used, and something escapes out of that and causes damage, you will be liable for the damage that has occasion out of that. Understand that. And again, for the students, note that. So if you're going to sit for a Ghana School of Law entrance exam or your end of semester, watch how the facts will appear. These two scenarios, each of them is still relevant to the Fletcher. The way the person is using the land or what he has brought onto the land, either case, if it will escape to cause damage, relevant to Fletcher for you. All right? Good. Now let's move on to the defenses to actions that are grounded on Rylands versus Fletcher. In this particular rule of Rylands versus Fletcher, what is going to be the defense? A lot of things. What is going to be the defense? Let's see some of the defenses. Now we are going to look at the defenses in Rylands versus Fletcher. If someone brings an action against another person for damages that has occasioned him because of the acts of a particular neighbor, what is going to be the defenses? Towards, towards that. Now, to give us a sense, an idea of what the defense is, let's go back to Blackburn's J's additional quotation, additional remarks, when he was given that landmark and powerful judgment in, in Rylands. There was something that he said. Let's, let's see what Blackburn J said. Blackburn J mentions, he can excuse himself by showing that the escape was owing to the plaintiff's default, or perhaps that the escape was the consequence of a vis major, or the act of God. You saw what Black J added. The excuses. So when we say the excuses, that is providing us an, a, a, an extension or a way for us to appreciate the kind of defenses that could be relied on when you have a matter that involves Rylands versus Fletcher. What could be the defenses, the excuses? So one is what we refer to as an act of God. An act of God. What is an act of God? You know, the concept of act of God is some, sometimes people call it force majeure and all that. Is, is referring to a natural occurrence that was not reasonably foreseeable by either of the parties. It could, for example, be a very violent storm. Let's take the example of the bees situation that I was trying to tell you. So this person brings onto his property and he's keeping bees, harvesting their, their honey for his other stuff. So on one particular day, extreme temperature, nobody knows what happened. Maybe because of some geographical changes or weather changes, there was... It was the highest temperature that has ever been recorded probably in the two or three year meteorological forecast in Ghana. Temperatures were so high. And you know, by the very nature of bees, when they have got high temperature, they decide to now, it, it, it excites them. The excitement means that it raises up their, 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 their kind of agitation and they, they tend to want to move around. So in such a particular situation, for about three years, he has kept the bees. No one has had any problem. But on this particular day, when the temperature was so high, the bees just decided to leave the cage and they left the hive, went around the community and just beating people and stinging them. All right. What is going to be the defense of this person who was keeping the bees? What is going to be the defense? What do you think? He can rely on an act of God, a force major, an extreme natural situation that he didn't have control over. That can be a defense. Or let's say a storm. All right. Within these times where sometimes there are storms, in that place where you go, there are hurricanes, air tremors, and all that, and maybe there's some. Violent storm. And this violent storm brings in heavy torrents of rain. And this rain is so torrential that it destroys the beehive and says that the bees have to leave. If they cause any trouble like that, we would say that it constitutes an act of God. So this can be the defense. Again, for the students, if you are reading a question, one of the things that will give you an indicator that this particular problem that has been posed to me is a Ryland and Fletcher question is that look at the facts. When you are identifying statements in there or situations within the context of the problem, that seeks to suggest a natural occurrence that was within or outside the contemplation of reasonable parties. It is telling you that this problem is a Ryland and Fletcher's issue. Okay, so you should know that. It will lead you to a point where you have to raise the defense of act of God against that. So that is it for the defense of Ryland versus Fletcher for the first one, an act of God. The second, if you look at Blackburn's quotation, he mentions that the default of the plaintiff, the default of the plaintiff, the default of the plaintiff will also be another ground of defense. In some literature, people may call it contributory negligence. That is, the damage that, was, that, that has occasioned was caused, by the, was caused by the plaintiff himself. 
So let me give the example of the dogs. Mr. A is keeping wild dogs. He's keeping pit bulls on his property because he's always been attacked by robbers and he's afraid. He's got a lot of expensive stuff, so he's keeping pit bulls there. Mr. B also likes to poke fun at those dogs. So when probably they are not there, he will just go and take a stick and he just be poking at them. Hey, dog. Hey, bulldog. You know, people usually do that in Ghana a lot. They like to be fan of dogs. So when you keep doing that and you are exciting the dog and the dog now jumps over the wall and chases you, chases you down, run over you and just bites you up. The question is, can you now claim those damages on the basis of Rylands versus Fletcher? that he was keeping it at, at his own peril, understood. But now contribu contributory negligence will kick in. This is what we call the default of the plaintiff. What you did triggered that particular situation. If you had not done that, maybe the dog wouldn't have been excited. You know, some people would just go around post purpose and just be knocking on the door. Hey, dog, now the case would just be knocking, bang, 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 bang. Now, when you are doing that, you are trying to excite those, those kind of situations. That is what we feel the, the, default of, um, the default of the plaintiff. It was your cause. Or if, for example, we take the, the case of the, um, of the bees situation. You know, these bees, they don't like certain kind of chemicals. You are aware that there are bees there. And you go and go and take this knapsack sprayer, okay, and make some obnoxious chemicals. And you just go to close to where the bees are. Bees, we cry, and they've been disturbing me a lot. Then, you know, we keep doing that. When they get exposed to those kind of smells, they'll be excited. So if in a mad rush, they leave the hive and chase after you and your family and beat you up. It's contributing negligence. The person who is affected by violence and Fletcher can rely on the default of the plaintiff as a defense. Do you understand that? Then the third one, the third and final one I want to mention is consent. Consent. So the consent will be either expressed or implied. Let's say that someone comes and lives in the community. Then he brings these wild dogs or he's keeping something there. Maybe he is producing alcohol, akpeteshi. So always they bring barrels of, um, of barrels of spirits. You know, spirits are, is, is flammable. Bring barrels of spirits, alcohol, highly concentrated. And he keeps it there. So you are aware that this person is keeping alcoholic spirits on the facility. Occasionally, when he produces the akpeteshi, he'll call you, oh, Wafa, please, can you come for some, some one glass? Then you go, then he'll give you one glass. So you know that this aquatechi that he's producing, it is coming from all these stacks and barrels of uh, highly concentrated alcohol that he's using on the property. So what are you doing? You are consenting to that action. Impliedly, you may not be, but you are consenting to it. So if a matter arises, and maybe out of a spillage, the alcohol enters into your facility and causes some kind of danger, an action in, uh, predicated on Ryland versus Fletcher can be challenged by the, by the defense of what? Consent. Or finally, I'll still go back to the famous example I keep on using, the issue of the dogs. Sometimes people will be living on premises, okay? It may just be apartments or sometimes neighbors. Then one neighbor will go and bring a very wild dog into his area, into his, into his house. Maybe you don't have high walls there. So you are aware that he has brought those dogs or he told you that, oh, I want to keep these dogs here. Okay, then he tells you, oh, that's fine. Sometimes it happens in, in, in compound houses or those things. One member who is just living in that joint tenancy common will just go and bring a dog onto the property. Then he tells the rest of the people that he has a dog that he's keeping. All right. So they, are, they have consented that he should bring the dog. So if now the dog comes onto the property and something happens, you understand that? The defense of consent may kick in. Hope you're okay. So that is how the defenses will work. So again, for the students, try and identify these kind of defenses. The act of God, okay, boss major. You've also mentioned, um, um, how do you call it? Default of the plaintiff. And also we've mentioned um, um, consent, all right? There can be a final one. Let me just add that. The final one will be um, a defense that someone may raise as an act of a stranger. An act of a stranger, all right? Let me use the example I mentioned about the bees. So, for example, there was a thief who was now jumping into this beekeeper's house. Probably on a very sunny day, around 11 a.m., 12 noon, he realized that there was nobody in the house. So this thief was trying to scale over the wall and jump into the building so that he can just go there and steal from him. He did, so when he, got, when he got there, he saw some, when he scaled over the wall, then he saw some rectangular wooden structure 
He thought probably it was a table. He just wanted to step on the table so that it would aid him to jump into the person's building. Not knowing that was a beehive. He stepped in, then he caved in. Then the bees just came out. Then they were beating the people in the area. So the question is that if you bring an action predicated on Rylands versus Fletcher, that the person who was keeping the bees, he was doing that at his own peril. His defense would be an act of a stranger because he didn't authorize that thief to scale over his wall and jump onto the hive. You, you, you get it? Aha. Uh -huh. So that is part of the defense that the person will avail to him in an act of Rylands on, on Fletcher, if it is predicated on the damages. I hope, I hope you're okay. So that is it for the subject of Rylands versus Fletcher. By way of reminders, Two points in Ryland versus Fletcher. If someone brings, collects, or keeps an item onto his property, and that item is likely to cause mischief, it is dangerous enough, if it escapes, it will cause trouble, he is prima facie answerable for any damages that will arise if that escape actually occurs. Point one. The other leg of Ryland versus Fletcher is that if someone pushes the land to an unnatural use, either he's using it in a way that is inconsistent with the acceptable, ordinary, and lawful use of the facility, and something escapes out of that activity that he's putting the land to and causes damage to another person, he is still caught by the rule in Rylands versus Fletcher. The defenses, force major, act of God, default of the plaintiff, consent, either explicit or implied, or an act of a stranger. I didn't authorize the third person to do what he did, and it has caused problems for us. These will be the defenses for an action in violence versus Fletcher. Hope you are cool. Stay tuned. Keep watching.